everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. This will certainly be an exciting and wonderful conversation on gender responsive policies in the ASM sector. Before we launch in and introduce our panelists for the day, I would like to introduce myself and my co-host. My name is Ashley Smith Roberts and I am an attorney and legal specialist with Love and Sources. Levin Sources is a social consultancy helping to build sustainable, equitable, and valuable mineral supply chains. We work with both governments and private clients around the world to ensure the mining and mineral sector can operate as a positive agent of change. My co-host, Ege Tekkenboss, is the Gender and Equality Advisor with IGF and IISD. She has over 15 years of experience working in the gender policy and women's empowerment space. So thank you all so much for joining us today. Today's webinar will feature leaders from around the globe working in policy and regulatory spaces impacted by gender and ASM. Their expertise ranges from environmental concerns to government and financial considerations. Our speakers will discuss government action on gender responsiveness in mining and will share experiences from government and industry. For our panelists, we have joining us today, Janet Adeyemi, President of Women in Mining in Nigeria. We have Eureka Primus, President of the Guyana Women Miners Association. We have Ruth Arpazi, Technical Coordinator of Alliance for Responsible Mining in Peru. We have Diana Gonzalez, Environmental Manager of Alliance for Responsible Mining in Colombia. And then we have Yao Bitrum, Program Manager for Responsible Mining in Solidaridad in Ghana. So before launching into our questions for today, why today, why now? Why this webinar? It's because women represent a large percentage of the workforce engaged in artisanal and small scale mining. Women make up to 40 or 50% on the continent of Africa alone. However, the contribution of women to the mining sector is often masked by the dominant profile of men's roles in mining, which has in some ways hindered women's meaningful participation and policy discussions related to the sector. In addition, the recent COVID-19 crisis has shown us how critical it is to include women's voices and perspectives in the policy domain. As we recently discussed in our joint report with IGF, more on this later, the policies, programs, and actions targeting the ASM sector during the COVID-19 crisis lacked a gender focus to a large extent. This resulted in many women miners experiencing greater hardship, suffering from lack of livelihood and being cut off from the sector. This experience also proved that we need to develop gender responsive mining policies for ASM today if we want to build a more resilient ASM sector for tomorrow. Before moving on to our panelists, I want to give the floor to Ege Tekkenboss from IGF to join me in setting the ground for today's discussions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ashley. Uh, I just want to say a few words and not taking too much time of yours, but uh, I, uh, I wanted to mention of our publications. Um, IGF and Levin Sources have partnered to fill in the data gap related to gender equality and artisanal and small scale mining. And when we did this, our aim was to support governments and also other stakeholders, including the industry and the civil society, to, to help them integrate gender equality and women's empowerment agenda in the policies and programs to support, but also to regularize the ASM. One of the first publications that we worked together was an annotated bibliography that includes 70 resources, including academic papers, toolkits, policy documents, and civil society and consultancy reports. Um, there was a geographical focus. Uh, we saw that most of the publications uh, centered on um, Africa and South America, uh, and, and they included case studies, uh, learnings that can be applied to many other areas. Uh, I will soon be posting the links for these publications in the chat box. And the second publication that I wanted to mention is uh, actually what Ashley has just mentioned about. It's a policy brief that outlines how the pandemic and related responses have served to exacerbate established gender inequalities concerning livelihoods, access to finances, access to land, and access to social services and support systems for women. 
These two publications complement each other. The annotated bibliography highlights how the existing policies and regulations in ASM lack a gender lens to include the voice of women in the sector and the COVID experience, the COVID-19 experience has proven how this long entrenched negligence have, had become catastrophic for many women and their families once triggered by a global crisis. I want to give some brief examples without going too much in detail, as these examples will be thoroughly featured today by our panelists. First of all, the lack of recognition of women ASM workers as a part of the workforce brought together unsafe working environments for women. In addition, women ASM workers were not able to benefit from public services that can be life-saving for them. In Kenya, for example, restrictions on ASM activities resulted in many women ASM workers being obliged to conduct their mining activities at night. And this obviously reportedly increased their vulnerability to gender-based violence. And another example is from Peru that we will be hearing more thoroughly today. Um, the informal status of many of the women ASM workers of Peru, Payaqueras, meant that nearly 80% of women had not received or were not eligible for any government aid. And it's important. Why it's important? Because most of all, ASM is very important for many countries in Africa and Latin America, with women being a major part of it. This is why any policy or program to regulate the ASM activities must recognize women's voice and agency. While the immediate shock of COVID-19 is now fading away, I think this gives us an opportunity to catch our breath and prepare for the future. We must take stock of policies, programs, and actions that have been implemented so far, and we should start discussing what could have been done better. And the next question we must, we must ask today is how we make sure that we do not repeat the same mistakes. I hope today's webinar will help us reach this goal. And accordingly, for me, the key question of this webinar is, to, is, is how do public and corporate policies drive change towards gender equality in the ASM sector? And we have great panelists to learn from their experiences today. So back to you, Ashley. I'm very eager to hear your questions to our panelists. Thank you so much, Ege. And to our audience, you may submit questions through the Q&A function of the webinar platform. We will have moderators who will do their best to either write back to you and answer the questions you may have, or if you have a question for a particular panelist, we can also see if there's time for you to be able to ask that question directly and have your question answered by the panelist. In addition, at the end of this webinar today, depending on timing, we plan to choose a few audience questions to ask the panel. In addition, as far as interpretation services, if you would like to hear this webinar in French or Spanish translations, please click on the globe labeled interpretation in the bottom right hand corner of your screen. Thank you. Okay, on to our esteemed panelists. So, Janet and Erica, it is so nice to have you here today. You are both presidents of your country's women and mining associations, Janet in Nigeria and Eureka in Guyana. You've both been working with lots of women who are involved in ASM as well as large scale mining. Can you give us a snapshot of the current status of gender responsive policies within the artisanal mining sector in your respective countries of Nigeria and Guyana? What are some of the promising initiatives that are emerging? And then also, what are some of the areas of concern for women and people in all genders and social groups? Because as we know, gender is not binary and it includes more than just men and women. Janet, if you'd like to start. Thank you so much, Ashley and uh, Ege, for this wonderful opportunity. Um, permit me once again to say happy International Women's Day. I guess all this is still part of breaking the biases and we keep on talking till we achieve our goal. Uh, gender policies in the extractive industry in Nigeria, from all I know, is that we still need both steps to be able to get there. Because let me just give you a quick hint on the background in Nigeria. Nigeria abandoned mining to go into oil and gas, which seems a low hanging fruit. But because of the crisis globally, which you can see what is even happening currently to oil and gas, they decided you know, to vent into mining, go back to the first law. And in doing that, 
there had been numerous challenges. So Nigeria must be bold to be able to help align the Nigeria mining sector with best global practices, looking at the fiscal, the fiscal responsibility laws, conflict management, social inclusiveness, technical linkages, human and gender rights. As we speak, we have some uh, the law, the 2007 Mining Act. The 2007 Mining Act, when you look at it, which is the main law regulating mining in the country, you find out that it is completely gender blind. The entirety of the law, that's the six chapters of the law, and the, all the sections, there's no single place where the issue of women or gender is mentioned. So that's the first indication that it is gender blind. Then subsequently, when you look at some sections, which I will just quickly quote, if you look at section 11, for instance, talking about social obligation, again, was completely silent about the needs of any, sector, any gender. Section 13 equally ignored the inclusiveness of women. And if I dare to go into details, it was talking about leadership. That is, the leadership in the community must be to the most prominent. Who is the most prominent in a, in a, in a, in a country where culture, religion, and major limitations? And the picture, you know, I purposely said the video should speak. When you look at the women in the picture, that speaks volumes to you. That is the condition under which women mine in the country. The laws are not, they are not protected. They are not guided. There's, there's no law actually regulating, even despite all efforts by government. Government has made quite a number of reforms, but those reforms are not gender specific. For you to be able to make any meaningful thing, you must be able to come up with transformative laws that will actually impinge or turn around you know, the fortunes of women in the sector. We don't have, we don't have laws you know, that look at the, for you to even know the well, about the welfare of the women that is talking about sex disaggregated data, we still keep on quoting figures of sub-Saharan uh, population being about 40% of social. We know we need to be specific. We have gotten to a junction where we actually must establish a baseline from which we, you know, if it's by annually or annually, we're able to match the activities in that sector to the SDG, you know, so that's where you're able to move forward. You look at the our labor law. Incidentally, the vice president maybe about a month ago said, oh, they are going to revise it. But it's part of the colonial inheritances, you understand? Crime more than the bereaved, where they said women cannot go underground and women cannot work at a certain, certain period of the day. So that's section 55 and 56 of the Nigerian labor law. You look at some other regulations too. The gender policy in Nigeria, for instance, allocated 35%. You know, we were part of the signatories, you know, for CEDAW and all those things. Oh, women must have 35% affirmative action. And I'm sure if you've been following the trend in Nigeria, you find out that in the last one month, the whole of March, Nigerian women, irrespective of what sector, all decided to fight the injustice being meted to them as regards um, inclusion or inclusivity in government. So uh, the, the creation of gender desk, gender desks are created, but are they actually addressing the issues? Are they actually collaborating? So these are critical issues that need to be looked at. And so when you talk about equal, equality, you find that the gaps do exist. The women, as we speak, we have just 6.8% of women and the entirety of the extractive industry as we, that's as data being put out by Naeti. So 6.8% and this 6.8%, where are they residing? They are at the lower bottom, lower value job. You are protecting them from risk, yet you plunge them into much risk. Look at the video shared. Look at the health of the women at risk, lungs issue, inhaling of chemicals, no, no, protective, uh, no protective gear. And even when we challenge the men, if you look further, you find that the men we are under the shelter, drinking, sipping wine and eating gala, while the women are laboring out in the sun. And when we accosted them, they said, yeah, they are being paid. And how much are they, are they being paid? Extremely poor wage, 500 naira. You know, that's, I think, less than a dollar. When they resume 8 o'clock in the morning and close 5 p.m. in the evening. And I'm just talking of two weeks ago, because that, those things you saw are two weeks ago in Ebony State, when I visited Ebony State with our team. So when you look at all these issues, you find out that it is high time we come up with reforms, reforms that are the holistic reforms that the ministry is doing, yes, fantastic. 
but you have to have the gender component. The gender component is very important because any country that neglects more than, and incidentally, the population in Nigeria, we almost one to one. That's 49.991% to almost 50%. That's almost one to one ratio. When you neglect more than half of your population, how can you develop? How can you develop the industry? And this is a highly technical industry. They don't have access to training. They don't have access to uh, good information management. They don't have access to uh, every component, every indicators that make mining extremely important for women to be able to participate. The funding is not there. You understand? So these are all issues government has to come into. Government will tell you that, oh yes, we uh, made arrangements with Bank of Industry to award, you know, to give uh, me some mega some to some members, but can they assess it? Because the standards, the bureaucracy tied to it. And remember the very nature of women, even very educated women don't want to be stressed chasing bureaucracy. A woman wants to hit it, hit it, because we are multitaskers. We have so many other things to do. So if somebody is going to boggle you down, you know, with filling forms, going back and forth, you just abandon it and go. And so precisely that was what is happening in the system. So Thank I believe so that we have to look at all these things holistically. And maybe subsequently, because I'm mindful of time, you understand? So we're just trying to rush so many things. So I believe that these things are very critical and very mica for us to be able to have a sound policy that we look at gender in the actual content. And you know, when we talk of gender, men at times seem strengthened. Oh, they are talking about women. No, gender defines men and women. But today we are emphasizing women because that is where the gap is. So if we really address these issues, you understand, I believe that we will have a better mining sector where we can actually ensure that equity is the norm of the day. Decision-making processes in Nigeria, for instance, you won't find women there. You have just one woman in heading one of the agencies in Nigeria. I don't think that is good enough. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And what you said is so true, that gender, it's not just about women. It's about all the genders that are being represented. But there's a focus on women for today because women are the ones who are suffering in the sector right now. And before we move on to the next question, I just wanted to give Eureka a chance to respond and talk about some of the policies and gender-focused initiatives that are occurring right now in Guyana, as you are the president of the Women in Guyana Mining Association. Thank you. Good morning, Ashley, and thank you a lot, Janet, for the outline in which you provided. It really puts things into perspective for today's talk. Um, firstly, let me just confirm that our mining regulations, as well as our Mining Act, does not restrict the full participation of women in mining from being landowners, operation owners at all scales, as well as any other form of participation in which they choose to have. At the same time, we do not have any enshrined laws or regulation that are particularly engendered. As such, there are no quotas for representation on state or private boards. There are no um, workforce representation quotas that are placed for women, both for large, small, and medium scale companies. With regards to pay gap studies, that has entirely not been done in Guyana, as well as no quotas for the consultation process when regulations and um, acts are being changed to ensure that the concerns and the issues that face women in the sector are taken into consideration during those processes, as well as um, the lack of gender equity and gender diversity goals for mining companies that entirely does not happen in our space. At the same time, um, one of the promising initiatives that has taken place and has actually been spearheaded by the University of Queensland is the establishment of the Delve Knowledge Exchange um, project, which is bringing together miners across the region. So for the first time, we're having conversations with women miners in Suriname and in Trinidad and Jamaica and finding out from them what their challenges are and also sharing with them 
our constitution and core documents so that they can start to become formalized in their country to sort of shift to a more regional movement of increasing representation for women in mining across the region. We've also engaged a consultant and hopefully this year we will be conducting a gender baseline for mining in Guyana. Since my, mining has been taking place in Guyana for well over my lifetime and most of the persons on the call. However, it was only in 2016 when the Guyana Women Miners Organization was added to the board of directors for the Guyana Geology and Mines Commission that gender was added to the application forms for all mining um, related processes. From that time to now, we're still awaiting the establishment of the gender database for minors so we can fully be able to understand and appreciate our contribution to the sector and our contribution to the development of the country as a whole. At the same time, um, some of the concerns that women have in mining in Guyana is the reduced participation of women in decision-making spaces. As it is, women in mining are not represented on our EITI multi-stakeholder group. We, our participation has also been significantly reduced on the regulatory agency that monitors mining nationally. And we're also concerned about the lack of um, consultation with regards to how miners will be able to sustain themselves during the mercury-free reduction initiatives that are currently taking place, taking into consideration with regards to miners accessing capital, as well as support to acquire the technology that will be needed to be introduced for miners to shift from using mercury to reducing and potentially eliminating the use of mercury in mining, as well as the reality that women oftentimes face more challenges with regards to acquiring capital from both banks and other other, other age, financial agencies. So in a snapshot, those are some of our realities for women in mining in Guyana. Thank you so much for that, Eureka. And I love the idea that there's going to be a gender-based baseline study to get more data on gender, because that's something when Ege and I were writing the publications for IGF was that there was so such a lack of gender disaggregated data available. So it's so important to make sure that we get those statistics and make sure we start getting that data out into the public sphere. Uh, Ashley, can I say uh, one important thing about the data? Uh, I was typing in the chat uh, chat box, and I will send this message to with the link. But I just wanted to mention that IGF with uh, partners, uh, International Labour Organization, International Women in Mining, uh, UNDP, and Swedish Environmental Protection Agency is now implementing a project called Women and the Mine of the Future. And this project is to be implemented in three phases, with uh, the first phase being focused on the baseline. Currently, we're trying to establish the baseline in 11 countries um, with, uh, actually, Argentina is joining in too, so it will be 20, uh, 12 countries in total. And the second phase will be about understanding the impacts of new technologies in mining on uh, this particular baseline that we set in the first phase. So I just wanted to uh, mention that I, I totally agree that the baseline is very, very important. And as IGF, we are also working in this particular uh, terrain. Thank you. Amazing. That is great to hear it, Gay. Thank you so much. And so now we move to Ruth Arpasi, based in Peru. So Ruth, in your work with Alliance for Responsible Mining, you're engaged with the Payaqueras. These are women artisanal and small-scale miners who collect residual gold ore along the mountainsides of the Andes region. Payaqueras have been tremendously affected by COVID-19 as they were cut off from their livelihoods when the quarantine measures were put in place. And they were also mostly excluded from support mechanisms, including healthcare, as they were not covered by the social security schemes offered to the formal workforce in Peru. These women miners who were already living at the extreme edge of poverty and were also shouldering unpaid work at home were among those that were most affected by COVID-19 in the Andes region. And again, in the IGF publications that we wrote, we talked a bit about the Payaqueras and did a case study on them, 
Ruth, can you tell us more about the main impacts of COVID-19 on the Payacaras in Peru? What were the main impacts and have there been any good practices to counteract these negative impacts that occurred? Muchas gracias, Ashley. Muy buenos días, tardes y noches a todos y todas de diferentes lugares del mundo. Estoy muy agradecida de antemano por este valioso espacio. Eh, como dijo Ashley, soy Ruth Arpasi, coordinadora técnica con enfoque organizativo de la Alianza por la Minería Responsable en Perú, trabajando desde la región andina eh, hacia el sur de Perú, entre, eh, entre Bolivia, eh, la región de Puno. Eh, desde el 2018 hasta la fecha, venimos acompañando a las mujeres mineras seleccionadoras manuales de oro. And which are um, uh, manual uh, collectors of gold, and they are the um, forest, uh, the end uh, uh, chain in the supply chain. They are called palanqueras, which is a quechua term, which means uh, collect something. I will be also talking on the name Palla, which is uh, related to all this, my presentation since 2018 through international cooperation funds, we've been helping this woman through a, a fort in two different uh, associations in this uh, high area altitude of uh, Los Andes in the, about 5,000 um, meters above sea level where women are working these palianqueras. These women are fighting for better conditions in their lives in, in extreme weather conditions in cold and they are joined with alcohol uh, violence and uh, social inequity. The um, life in this part of the Andes generates very physical uh, and health problems related to the health of this, this woman. Uh, added to this, the use uh, of non-responsible use of mercury, which uh, turns them uh, high vulnerable, not only them, but only their child. Um, there are many women working in the palenqueros are single women and working in that palenqueo only because they have no choice every year they leave their original uh, homelands and go to these mining locations for looking for a better future and with having a temporary dwellings and quite uh, poverty uh, housings, they are only having uh, access to electricity, but no water or drainage or sewage. So one of the main purposes of women has been always the being inserted in very included in their labor force, but in many times it has been uh, their in, involvement has been in, in informal way because the policies for formalization of ASM and for the selecting of uh, for mineral collectors has very many caps, uh, gaps regarding um, the trading of the minerals because this reverts the situation they are looking for, which is a higher education for their children and better uh, living conditions. It has been a very, very difficult moment uh, the last times in the, the uh, worldwide uh, COVID situation, but the palanqueras specifically were um, cut off from their living hoods uh, when, once the quarantine uh, conditions were implemented and they were excluded from any support mechanisms, uh, which included medical care because they were not covered by the social security plans, nor for these uh, supporting mechanisms that were offered to formal uh, labor force. So palliacaras are quite affected by COVID-19 until now, 
and it has been one of the more affected in the India, Indian region. For the governmental institutions, the Palyakeras have been just mentioned as mining women with a high level of incomes, apparently, and this has difficulted the access to uh, social supports like the bonds to help them in their economic crisis and the, uh, the Paliakeo activity has been affected by the reduction of oil of gold in the Rinconada area because many uh, miners have been uh, uh, processing even the dump sites, which were the places in which these uh, mining uh, women uh, mining were collecting the ore, so that ended up in having a scarce uh, mineral to be selected for them, and thus reducing even further their incomes uh, that they may be able to get from in this process of paliakeo. So all these difficulties have been uh, have been uh, trying to be helped with uh, positive uh, initiatives uh, that will be helping them. And these are a few of them, like uh, some of the activities that were performed were from uh, the Association for Responsible Mining, the Alliance for Responsible Mining, we have been seeing some, uh, applying some strategy in order to support the Paliakeras women, which we call the gov mining governance strategy with a gender a focus promoting the training on mining empower, uh, women empowerment and leadership and helping uh, leaders to help them uh, approach the challenges they face daily with uh, their representation in uh, in organizations and networking activities so that they may know the different uh, um, uh, mechanisms available in the uh, uh, official uh, areas. Uh, also, it is uh, we are expecting that they. It's not to expect that the government reach them, but th that the women uh, find those places and participate uh, in that areas. And, and for that, they need a lot of support. And we've been helping them with training in uh, health. Uh, at work and uh, reproduction, uh, and also care for the environment and the, uh, knowing how, uh, nutrition with the foods that are uh, available in this area of Peru, and to be able to have some uh, benefits from the COVID-19 uh, crisis, because till now they have not been able to uh, get any support um, to be able to recover and regain the paliakeo activity after the COVID. Also with training regarding the environment and also uh, under the uh, framework of uh, economic and productive diversification because they have found out that the reduction in their income is mostly uh, devoted to the, that the paliakeo is, uh, going backwards and being reduced so they need to see any other alternatives for their production and their livelihoods and other business opportunities so that maybe later uh, be able to start their activities for their livelihoods and improve the conditions of all of them so we are working also with the women in the in strengthening of their associations and strengthening of their business uh, activities and to find out some business activities that they may be able to find so that they be an alternative for their economic activities similar to the or different to the mining activity so that they may have a formal uh, employment and be able to have a, a social security, financial inclusion, and uh, find these uh, business uh, ideas. At present, we are working with an association of paliaqueras in San Francisco, 
in La Rinconada about 15 women uh, and related to the self-financing acts in surrotatory funds, which are non-responsible and uh, are financed by the Ensign uh, Association, and it's leverage uh, and, 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 a, and a financing for the following their business activities and to go continue with their palakeo activities. So we really appreciate that. And we find, uh, we are trying to find out the different activities towards, this is a starting point so that they may be able to uh, leave these uh, crisis and in the future they may have better opportunities through cooperation international and national uh, cooperation thank you very much for your attention thank you so much ruth that was very enlightening talking about the payakeras and some of those interventions that are happening right now with the women in the andes region now we are moving to colombia and speaking with diana gonzalez who is representing the alliance for responsible mining in Colombia. Today's mining sector, including in Colombia, is largely shaped by the transition away from fossil fuels to a low carbon economy. This puts an increased importance on critical raw materials. Diana, how is this transition expected to impact women in ASM? What are some of the policies that we should be expecting to see from governments and from companies? Hola, gracias por la invitación. Eh... Good morning, thank you so much for your invitation. I am leading environmental management uh, topic uh, for the Alliance for Responsible Mining. In addition to Colombia, we've been working for 15 years in different countries in South America, Central America, and Africa as well, where we support especially artisanal and small-scale mining and to improve their technical environmental uh, practices and also including this gender approach. In this presentation, I'd like to focus a little bit on some numbers regarding Colombia. I wanted to show you the status of these issues in Colombia right now. As we said earlier, Colombia committed to reduce by 51% their gas, uh, greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 and to become carbon neutral by 2050. In terms of the role of women in ASM, According to the official numbers of the Colombian Ministry of Mines and Energy, women represent only 8.8% .8 for industrial mining, that is mechanized mining, uh, mining with greater access to technology, and over 70% in ASM. So here we could engage in this discussion of how women are sometimes disregarded uh, for mining activities because of the physical effort, but actually ASM requires a much greater physical effort than mechanized mining, and we see that it represents 70% for the workforce in this sector. As you may know, the effects of uh, the climate change on mining uh, have a greater effect on women than on men, particularly in those ecosystems where mining activities are conducted in Colombia, such as in the rivers that women use also for other housework, for fishing, and other activities. Some uh, these sites where mining activities are conducted in Colombia, it's not only because they have no other choice, they do have other choices that are actually exploited as well and women have a wide range of economic activities. However, mining is the one that creates the uh, better resources. So they spread their time between fishing, agriculture, mining, and every single activity that is permitted in the ecosystems where they, re where they live. In terms of, let me come back to that one. She stands corrected. In terms of decarbonization of the economy or the, uh, energy transition, Colombia has a very uh, far-reaching commitment, actually one of the far farthest reaching in South America, and it has created policies, policies around the policies. That is a whole energy transition policy for the mining sector, and in addition to that, there is another policy that uh, 
embeds gender in my name, but there is no one intertwining the both. I mean, like what would be the role of women in this decarbonization process or what, what are the opportunities for women? And I'd like to talk about other opportunities as well. Although the energy transition and the new green business and new activities may bring about different job of opportunities, probably with greater economic independence. Well, uh, that is yet to be seen because we believe that what I'm showing here in the presentation has not been taken into consideration because since women represent 70% of um, ASM workforce, they should have a greater participation and also lead these policymaking spaces because it's not only taking solutions to, to the territories, but collecting these women's ideas to mitigate and adapt to climate change. That is, they should not only be the subject or matter of those policies, but they should be involved in the policymaking process. But there is this gap in terms of the opportunities offered by the state in this regard. I wanted to mention uh, some opportunities offered by other actors, by other stakeholders, such as international organizations and other stakeholders. And I wanted to highlight the For a Smart ASM standard, which fit to supplement other standards already in place for the mining industry, such as the graft standard or the fair mining standard. I'm sure that many of you already know it, but if you don't, you can visit our website. There's a lot of information on that. This standard was developed in order for mining to become more consistent with these forest ecosystems. And there was a pilot uh, project in Toco in Colombia, another one in Peru and other countries, and it was developed jointly with 11 sources and fauna and flora international. And one of the positive aspects of this is that it recognizes the importance of preserving our forests, preserving the ecosystems they have to offer, but it also recognizes that ASM is a traditional activity that is one of the livelihoods of these peoples. And uh, it cannot be simply eradicated, but rather we should seek to integrate it we should think uh, of how to articulate them both. As part of this standard, there are different criteria that not only include technical management and environmental management, but also community relations. And precisely trying to determine who are the people that live in these areas and to make sure that mining takes place upon an agreement with these peoples and uh, that there is a holistic uh, review of the environmental impacts and integrating every stakeholder, government, the private sector, to make sure that this climate change uh, mitigation actions are sustainable in time and that the community plays a key role in implementing such solutions. Another important aspect of this standard is that it opens up different business opportunities in terms of uh, carbon markets such as uh, red uh, plus and other ones that are already uh, on the market. So we wanted to point out the different opportunities available and the challenges associated with them. If you want any more information, any more news, you can just visit our website and you'll find it there. Thank you so much. Deanna, as she was saying, it's so important that we ensure that we take the environment into account as well in any conversation that we're having on ASM, especially when thinking about climate change policies. And now we have Yao Bitrum from Ghana. So when we discuss policy, it's best strategy to learn from good examples. And these good examples often come from civil society or local governments, as these are the closest to the people that the policies impact. Today we have Yao Bitrum from Solidaridad Ghana. And I believe their efforts to bring women's voices and agency to the forefront while working toward mercury-free gold production, due diligence, an ASGM formalization could help us conceptualize what gender responsive ASM policies imply. Yao, can you tell us more about your work in Ghana? And can you give us some concrete examples that can showcase formalization of ASM with a focus on gender equality and women's empowerment? All right, thank you, Ashley. Uh, 
and also good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you all, participants, um, wherever you may be. Um, let me first of all start by briefly talking about our organization, the Solidaridad. Um, we are a civil society, an international civil society organization um, with over 50 years of experience um, in developing solutions to ensure sustainable supply chains. Um, we currently work in over 40 countries globally, and also we, are, we have presence in five continents and work through eight regional offices. Our mining program in West Africa focuses on improving livelihoods, working conditions, and also ecosystems of artisanal and small scale miners. And we are, we are all aware that the women play a very important role in ASM. They are underpaid, undervalued. They also run severe health risk and are also exposed to violence as well. Um, at the same time, ASM is an essential income generating activity for women. So there is an urgent need for support um, to overcome these challenges. So how do we address these challenges? Um, you all agree with me that addressing gender inequality is very complex. And as such, whatever solution that you decide to come out with should be able to tackle all the various aspects of it. So for us in Solidarity, we've come out with a holistic approach to addressing the problem and a point that is also sustainable as well. So what do we do specifically? Um, we do have three key pillars that we focus on in addressing gender inequality in ASMs. Um, the first is looking at advocacy at both uh, in the national level, international level, and also at the local level as well. We also have interventions at the mine level. And lastly, supporting women's groups in both mines and also uh, mining communities. So these are the three key pillars of our approach to addressing um, the very complex gender inequality in ASMs. On advocacy, um, we engage with policymakers um, through multi-stakeholder platforms, and also um, building the capacity of like-minded organizations to support our advocacy work, because generally in advocacy, um, you cannot do it all alone. We need to also have other organizations supporting your work or pushing the same agenda. We also do have bilateral engagements um, with policymakers to support them to formulate, review, and also implement women-friendly mining policies as well. So we have very close relationships with um, policymakers. So that's basically advocacy. Uh, and when we come down to the mind level, how can we help improve on gender inequality at the mind size? We engage with Project Mind, as well as project, uh, the, the mind management, to develop and implement gender responsive policies and also practices on the mind size. Um, the first thing that we look at is looking at um, better working conditions for women on the mind size, ensuring that they uh, uh, mind responsibly. Put on, put, they put in on the right PPE before working, especially also looking at the negative impact of mercury on women, especially, and also the yeah, unborn babies. So we have a number of training programs that we conduct on the mind sites and using the craft code as a guide in the work that we do, or as a tool in the work that we do. So we have different training programs on mind sites, looking at also health and safety, um, environmental management, um, responsible use of mercury, good labor conditions, also looking at gender issues specifically um, as part of the craft code. The other aspect of it is also looking at improving the positions of women on the mind side, um, because we are all aware that they, they do very low uh, paying jobs. So we try to provide them with skills training so they can get better jobs on the mind side. And of course, that also help improve on their incomes as well. Um, so this is basically to do with the mind side interventions. Um, lastly, we're looking at more of directly um, um, targeting the women, both on the mind side and also in the communities. This will help ensure women's access to and also control of our resources um, within the mining space. So with this, what we do, um, we're looking at, first of all, what we call household discussions whereby we bring both the male and the female in the household to have gender discussions for them to understand some of the gender issues because um, our interventions will help increase the income of the woman. So of course, there should be some form of discussion as to, um, in order to prevent gender-based violence once that happens. So the, the, there are a number of discussions that we do have at the household level. And also we 
also do livelihood skills training in the communities to provide alternative livelihoods for the women. If you are aware, most of these women work very few hours in a day on the mine sites. So there is a need for us to also provide them with also alternative livelihoods whilst also doing their skills on the mine sites as well. And we have what we call the village savings and loan associations, whereby we form groups, women's groups within the mines and also in the communities. And the objective of this is to inculcate the habit of savings in the women, um, whereby they save over a period, once the, it gets to the end of a cycle, they take the money and invest in their business. Yes. And this is to help improve on access to finance um, for the women um, in order for them to improve on their livelihoods. We've had um, experiences whereby some of these women use their money to invest in mining businesses and also others also investing in other businesses within the mining community. Um, we just some few years ago piloted um, a group managed revolving fund um, with support from Karen. We did pilot a group managed revolving fund whereby we give some money to the uh, women's groups for them to manage themselves as part of the BSLA uh, discussion. So what we did was to give sort of a top up to them. So that increased the amount of money available to them for investing in their businesses. And we've had a study on that which revealed that uh, most of their business have expanded and have improved. They now have improved incomes. And of course, I also using the money um, to further invest in their business to better expand them as well. So um, with that also, in order to ensure sustainability, we try to also link them to relevant institutions within the, uh, their community. Peace. Um, such as the business advisory um, centers in, in, in the districts and also the local authority as well. And also looking at financial institutions because once they get more money, they need to save, save it in a, in a safer place. So then we also link them to financial institutions as well. Um, so these are some of the um, interventions that we do have um, in the um, um, mining communities. And also in order to promote women's involvement in mining, we also link them to the Minerals Commission and as well as the agents responsible for mining. So they would understand the processes involved in starting their own mining activities, the permits that they need to get and all that. Um, so this is um, basically what we do also at the um, community level. So generally these three interventions, looking at advocacy, intervention at the mine level and also support women's groups um, have really so, um, helped ensure that we have very good policies in place that have been implemented by government. At the mine site level also, they do have very good policies and practices in place to ensure that women are empowered. And also in the communities to ensure that women um, have access and also control over resources. Thank you. Um, here, I want to ask a question to our panelists and please feel free to answer. Um, whomever want to answer can, can answer my question and I wanted to bring the attention back on the sorry um, changes in the mining sector we know that the mining sector is going through a fundamental change and this change is is being uh, is a result of many factors including um, global trends such as rising demand for minerals and metals also the need for advanced technologies to meet the decarbonization goals, as also mentioned by Diana during her intervention. And also there is the growing pressure from uh, investors to mine more responsibly and equitably. And all these trends together are changing the outlook of the mining uh, mining sector altogether. And um, our panelists have, have highlighted some very important issues like uh, women are already women miners, women ASM miners, are already having difficulty in terms of access to, to equipment and training. And, and also we heard from Ruth that uh, the gold reserves, easily accessible gold reserves are diminishing for women miners. So in this context, I was wondering uh, what the future holds for women in ASM. Um, one question I, I certainly have in mind is if climate change, uh, climate smart mining and destructive technologies could offer more opportunities for women in ASM, are, are women in ASM sector, are, are they ready enough to meet the technological revolution happening in the mining sector? And, and more, especially, more importantly, what role should the large scale mining play to make sure that new technologies required for climate smart mining become available for women ASM workers, especially those that are in their supply chains? So um, 
I want to ask this question to the group of panelists that we have today and please feel free to answer. I see that Janet, yes. do you want to go first? No problem. Thank you. I, um, the climate issue is a dominant issue. So the thing is that, is it a choice? I tell people it's not a choice because we have seen the effects of global warming and we had what COP26, all the declarations made. And then what is the alternative? The alternative is the use of critical minerals. So the critical minerals obviously will become more competitive. So it's now left for women and that is the space we occupy now as NGOs, as associations to build up our capacity. We cannot continue to cry of marginalization. We need to move. And that movement is what led to what we did in Nigeria on the 8th of, the, of uh, March, when we launched what we call the G4M, that's Girls for Mining. Because if you look backwards, you find out that you must have thinking of new strategies to mainstream and encourage more women to come into the sector. So that you do by advocating STEM development, making sure that the new generation of women, a girl that is 12 years today, before 2030, 2030 years, we sing it every day, but it's still very far off. The girl who is in, this, is in higher institution today, if you start molding them and building them, building their capacity in that trend, you'll be surprised at the number of girls who will embrace mining. Coupled with the fact that you have artificial intelligence, you have nanotechnology, you have robotics, and you know, all those things are areas to look at. So what can the small, big companies do? The big companies now, you understand, should shift, a paradigm shift from what it used to be, and handing us peanuts to make sure that they invest so much in training. Training, capacity building, skill acquisition, giving scholarships, using their profits, you understand, incentivize so many things in terms of education for the women group in the community they are. So the transition between the old and the new becomes extremely, because through formalization and bringing the old, that is those people who can no longer, because there's an age, you can no longer train somebody. Some can no longer adapt to the use of the modern technology. You can formalize them into cooperatives and then support them to be able to work with you. That way, the new technology you're embracing because it is skill acquisition, they can you know, imbibe the skill, while the new generation that is coming, you understand, are well-versed, are well-educated, and I don't know, maybe you have experienced it, there are some things you want to do on the computer, and you find it difficult to do, and your daughter just comes and says, oh, mommy, you are old school. Within the, you know, they do it, and so many things like that. So I believe that when we start imbibing that trend, we'll be able to go far. And then profiling, you know, the new technologies are not even as difficult as we think in terms of, look at uh, energy, for instance. We know that water is one of the adverse consequences of climate that is flooding and things, and, uh, things like that, because when you have climate change, it leads to increased sea level and flooding where women are mostly affected, especially maybe with tailings and things like that. So. When they are properly formalized, even the women, that is the ASM women, who mine using negative methods, methods that are not scientific, can be taught, you understand, to adapt and change to healthier methods of mining. So this holistically, you understand, I believe we drive the kind of result we want towards a, a carbon-free um, uh, environment. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Janet. Uh, Diana, do you want to answer? ¿Quieres, quieres responder, Diana? Sí, hola. Eh, quería dar como una doble respuesta. Hi. I would like to give here a double answer. And on one side, women, mining women in these ecosystems in forests are willing to help with the climate change approach because they live there in they know the environment and they are conscious about the cares that need to be provided and the problem is in the access to technology in being prepared uh, maybe through the government or private organization that they may have a chance to access knowledge and be able to uh, give their contribution to these uh, goals of climate 
change because we still see in some areas of our country, some uh, people who still do not know how to use their te uh, smartphone. Mm -hmm. So it will be very difficult for them to access to virtual training. And in the last years, it has been a, there has been a change, but still it's a challenge. Uh, ask one of the questions that we got from the from the uh, participants. Yes, please do, Ege. Okay, so okay, I'll go first. Um, there are two questions that also one of one of them is answered already in written, but I think it's a very interesting question. So. Um, it's it's a bit long please bear with me uh the question says there have been many there have been concerns raised that women in mining groups and organizations uh, tend to dialogue with women miners who are in position to secure a license so the question is mostly about um the, the readiness and ability of these organizations to to uh connect with uh unless unlicensed lower to mid tires of the sector's labor hierarchy how can women in mining organizations be empowered to advocate for women at all levels and what have been some of the challenges from your own experiences uh urika you answered this question in written but do you want to come and uh, answer to uh all all participants Hi, guys. Sure, no problem. I'll be able to do so. Um, with regards to ensuring that the voices of Par all are included in the conversations for not only with international organizations, but even in decision making, it's to the number one priority is ensuring that they have access to participate. We recognize that while the use of technology is increasing across the globe and even in Guyana, the need for them to have someone within their community, within their mining district that they may be able to go to, to voice their concerns, to request support, to even in some cases make their objections known is oftentimes very critical because there, there are few persons who are bold enough to even speak in a WhatsApp group with everyone present. And, but there are also those persons who will have critical um, information to share or even recommendations that prefer to do that one-on-one -on -one in their community of origin. And oftentimes when you have large consultations, they do not provide resources to support your transportation. So that is even one of the reasons why you find large organizations oftentimes interface with the persons who have more privilege within the sector because in the event that there is a meeting, can the miner who is working in the interior afford to leave their work site, travel out to the capital in most cases to participate in a discussion to fund their transportation, hotel and food while they're in the capital and return to their mine site and their answer is no, they can't afford to do it so. But at the same time, most of the consultations do not for miners oftentimes do not go into the mining districts, which I think is something in which the organizations that the person who asks the question should consider. You can be for miners without going into the mining districts, else you'll just be interfacing with some miners. So, in, and even when women mining organizations are setting targets with regards to what areas are they going to focus on, what challenges are they going to address, to ensure that their representatives within the regions and within the sub-districts also consult the members within those areas to have their voices included. Because oftentimes the challenges that the persons who are at the top may see may be different from those who are living with different levels of challenges, especially for those who are in the smaller scales of mining. So those are just some of my contributions, and I'm sure that Janet may want to add a bit to it as well. Janet, do you want to chip in? Yeah, I agree with uh, my sister. I you see, the issue of women in mining I don't know of other countries, but in my country, till date, we've not gotten direct intervention or support from government. And so just as she said, it becomes extremely challenging when you try to invite women, women don't come. 
you have to go and meet them. So we have to travel, you know, to the various sites. And you can't blame them because when they leave whatever they are doing to attend to you, they lose their, lively, their livelihood for that day. The income they are supposed to make is lost. So no amount of education you want to give them that they want to take. However, if governments will actually see that women in mining are filling a space, you understand, to address the issues, governments should take it serious. Donor agencies, you understand, should learn to work with women in mining who understands the terrain of their country, who understands the nitty gritty of who to meet. I believe that in doing all that, we'll be able to actually target the, 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 the people and bring about the needed intervention in that sector. Again, you find out that women generally, because of their poor education, because most women who are in the ASM sector are really not educated. And because they are not educated, talking about technology is an issue. You need to find somebody domiciled within them in their workplace where they are doing one, where they are doing their manual manual work or whatever to be able maybe during their lunch time or something find time to be able to put them through because you see this Zoom meeting we are doing I'm talking to you now maybe you are in Canada or or Ashley is in Canada I'm in Houston right now but you know what the local women can't join. So they are excluded even from the good things we are trying to bring to them. How do they get this thing? That is the challenge. Bring in a, a multinational or bilateral organization, you cannot reach to them. The women in mining organization is still the one who can actually reach to them where they can maximize. Burnout. You can interface with people in the city, you can interface with people in government, but meeting those people who constitutes the people you really want to meet to change their thinking, to change their style, to change their method of, uh, uh, of, of mining, you can't assess them because they, you, they will not even, you cannot even communicate with them. So to me, I believe that it is very important in the hierarchy of, the, of mining, you understand, women in mining, now that we are all coming together, what you have done today is very good. Let's continue to strengthen one another and look for strategies on which we can use in engaging these local women. Thank you. I really like this end message, Janet, but uh, Erika wants to say a few words about this uh, issue as well, I guess. Uh, some additional thoughts, Erika? Yeah, Sige. Um, just a few additional things. I think oftentimes people underestimate how hard it is to sustain a women in mining organization. I, Janet Ma Ma mentioned the lack of government support. So the same women who are representing miners, reviewing policies, trying to make changes, they're also parents. They also have their own jobs. They also have to try to sustain the organization. The cost of rent, the cost of staff, the cost of utilities, the fact that oftentimes to keep things going, you have to apply for grants and grant, pro grant processes are exceedingly long. And oftentimes for the smaller organizations, especially for those that are newly formed, there isn't that level of support for them to be able to even qualify for some of the grants that may be available. So it has its own myriad of challenges to not only be able to support women in mining, but also to sustain the women in mining organization altogether. Thank you so much. Um, I think this was a very important discussion and I'm glad we had time to talk through this, this question. And I think the question was also very good because it triggered a conversation that was much needed. Um, one last question that I want to read from the floor uh, is, is for Ruth. Um, the question is, uh, I see that Ruth, you're typing uh, your answer, but uh, we can answer this uh, to, to everyone, actually. Uh, I will read the question in Spanish, um, because it's possible. 
cierto que es Although it is true that it is possible to try to find alternatives for the work of Pazaquera women, these women collectors, shouldn't we think of improving their current conditions in order to increase their work participation and efficiency in the mining sector? Ruth, do you care to answer? Thank you. Of course. And thank you so much for this question. We believe that the different financial alternatives that is important without disregarding the current conditions of these mining women and uh, to try to improve these conditions. So in that regard, we are pretty much focused and completely agree with the previous discussion that first of all, we are seeking to empower women and to strengthen the uh, female leadership so that they don't need to be excluded from these discussions, but rather become a part of it. What generally happens in the mining sector? Well, there's a lot of uh, male chauvinism. There is an exclusion uh, of the ideas that may be contributed by women. They are ruled out. These women are just not heard and they are not even invited to the different fora where a public policies in favor of the ASM are discussed. And with their exclusion, they exclude also all the possible solutions for the formalization of these Pajakera women. So empowering these women will lead these women to uh, know the policy, the, policies applicable to them. And with that knowledge, they may approach the institutions seeking the necessary support so that they can better articulate the policies for the formalization of this sector. Although it is true that the formalization of this pasaqueo or mineral collection may only be applicable for one region of the country, the Puno region, where these pasaqueras work. But there are many, many gaps in terms of taxing in terms of uh, trading in a sector that is rather informal, even when it comes to the purchase of ore. Women have been waiting for years and years for a solution to these issues, but empowering them, uh, strengthening their skills, providing business training that will lead to formalization has led them to come up with ideas where they want to be the ones that can purchase the ore from the Pazaqueras themselves. All they need is the financing to do that. But how do they approach these institutions? Not with claims, but with a proposal for solution, with alternatives so that they can actually be the ones that are the recipients of the support of these institutions, not only local institutions, but also international organizations. So the way I'd like to frame this question is, we should start by empowering women. Uh, back to you, Ashley. Thank you so much, Ruth. We've gone a bit past time. Thank you to everyone that has stayed and participated. I am just shocked that we have almost 130 people still on the call. This was such an engaging, enlightening conversation. Thank you to all of our expert panelists from around the world, from Ms. Janet Abiyemi in Nigeria, Yao Batram in Ghana, Ruth Arpazi, Peru, Diana Gonzalez, Colombia, Erica Primus in Guyana. It's just been such an amazing conversation talking about the financial considerations, the regulatory considerations, environmental considerations, everything to do with women in mining. For all of our participants, if you are interested in any of these speakers and want to learn more, again, go to some of the links that we shared earlier about some of the resources, look these women up online, they're available, they're there to answer your questions. If you wanna support any of the organizations or just learn more about the work that they do, please do follow up and please do so. Also, we had a few questions about the recording. This meeting has been recorded and it will be sent out to everyone who registered by email. So watch out for that in your emails over the coming days. And thank you so much again. I don't know if anyone else wants to say goodbye before we wrap this up, but this has been such an amazing conversation and just thank you all for being a part of this. Yeah, I, one last thing I forgot to talk about. I think, do I have the floor? 
Can I go on? Go ahead. Okay, thank you. In the course of discussion, ESG, I think, is a good weapon women can use. The gender, you understand, the gender, we should start advocating seriously for ESG because within the window of ESG, we have opportunity, you understand, for inclusion, for growth, you know, as career professionals. As you know, anything we want to do within, because we just have to make it mandatory in every country. Some countries are still not, but if we enforce on ESG, ESG will be able to address all the issues and then link it with human rights. Because we had a workshop where we were, we are still trying to talk with our CAC, that's the body that registers company in Nigeria. If you have a column where companies that refuse to respect gender, gender rights are reported to human rights because abuse of gender is abuse of human rights. Then their co company papers can be revoked from practicing. If when we start pushing for such advocacy, I tell you we will get results. More organizations will start respecting women. Thank you. Thank you so much.